many people as possible with as much wonderful cultural information that we can gather. So um, I'm going to keep my remarks short because we only have an hour this evening, but I'm going to um, introduce Pat Gwynn, who has been here at the Cherokee Nation for, I believe, 17 years. And I think he has a program here that I... Uh, hasn't received enough attention. What he has done for the Cherokee Nation and for the Cherokee people in terms of collecting and studying our heirloom seeds is so important. Heirloom meaning this is what our ancestors used. And so anyway, I just, I want to acknowledge him for that as well for keeping this alive in our tradition and our culture. So I'm going to introduce Pat Gwynn at this time. Thank you for coming, Pat. Thank you, no applause necessary. After you hear my public speaking skills, you'll understand why. Um, as uh, Ms. Mackey said, uh, my name is Pat Gwynn. I work for the Cherokee Nation Administration Support Department and have been here for uh, 20 plus years. We won't go into specifics. Uh, currently, uh, I'm the administration liaison and uh, I have been blessed uh, by the nation to be able to do a lot of really nice projects. And uh, over the last uh, seven, eight years, I have uh, uh, have worked with some really good people that have allowed uh, the Cherokee Nation to do what uh, really no other Indian tribe in the United States ha has been able to do. And uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, a lot of you may have came uh, expecting to see the word ethnobotany at the top of the screen, but uh, ethnobotany is a limiting term. Uh, that's really used more in academics, the, a true term that would describe the relationship between uh, Cherokee people and uh, the environment would be ethnobiology because it wasn't just plants. And we're just going to move right on into this. Uh, if you have a question, I know we're on live webcast TV, but uh, we will pretend like it's just us in this room. Just raise your hand or blurt something out and we'll stop in the middle of things and answer questions. Uh, Remember I said that the Cherokee people were, uh, uh, were somewhat of a, uh, of a group of people that were inexorably intertwined with the environment. And here you have a picture of a very kind of small, uh, some might even say insignificant animal. This is the cardinal, just a little red bird. Uh, has a nice little uh, white head on it, uh, but uh, not all that uncommon. We see these every day and think nothing of them. It's just a bird that maybe comes to our bird feeders and really doesn't have anything to do with us as a people. However, uh, and I'm not going to read to you, we're all adults here, but if you look at this small, insignificant bird, what you actually see is that uh, this bird to the Cherokees meant a lot of things. Uh, it, was, it was a harbinger of, of lots of things. And, uh, one of the things that I stress in talking about ethnobiology, we often hear only the very good and the very bad. And that's really not true. Just about everything would have uh, the ability to, con to connote both uh, uh, good things to come and maybe some things that aren't so good. But uh, I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg when we're dealing with the environment. A little bitty bird that we see every day and don't give any thought to. Let's go to one order of magnitude higher. Let's look at the white-tailed deer. And once again, trust me, we're going to get to talk about plants here in a minute, but I want to show you the relationship that Cherokees had with the environment back in the days of pre-removal. If we look at the white-tailed deer, uh, uh, of course it's famous around here for deer season and not much else, well I guess for car accidents, but uh, the white-tailed deer was Oh, as an animal, it was almost everything to the tribe. It was a textile source. We wore them as a clothes. It was a religious icon. It was one of our, our clans were named after it. It was a source of credit. When we needed uh, to uh, uh, obtain something that we uh, didn't have, uh, you know, proper goods to trade for, we could use the white-tailed deer. Uh, the, the wealthiest individuals had the, uh, the best uh, places to hunt. Uh, and as the deer became so environment, our people, the Cherokees, which, you know, of course, savages is the term that was used, but actually what happened was the Cherokees, over a thousand years ago, began altering the, the landscape, the entire environment, to improve the life of this animal. 
And when you're tied to the environment, as I said, both good things and bad things can happen. The Europeans came to uh, the North American continent, uh, introduced to us some concepts that we weren't really familiar with. And uh, one of those concepts was uh, taking things now and paying for them later. And uh, Cherokees became quickly enamored with trade goods. Uh, when uh, the seasons were off and we couldn't, weren't able to afford those things, we traded in deer futures with uh, these with the Europeans. And uh, the actual first piece of land loss of our ancestral homelands wasn't a treaty violation. It wasn't an act of war. It was because we became so far in arrears in our debt of white-tailed deer to the Europeans that they actually took the European settlers took some of our tribal lands because we couldn't make our deer payment. And, uh, you know, of course, that started a whole, uh, the snowball effect, uh, which ultimately led to removal. I show you this slide uh, because as we're about to get into plants, you're going to see something that basically, uh, for the first, uh, uh, for the for, for the first hundred years after removal, basically maintain the Cherokee identity. You see the red blob up there. That's the old Cherokee nation. That's the ancestral homelands. Uh, if you were to uh, overlay the ecotype of eastern deciduous forest, that would cover that red blob and go all the way to touch the eastern part of Oklahoma. And what that did was, even after removal, the plants and animals that we used back east were the same plants and animals, or at least very closely related plants and animals that we had in Oklahoma. It, was, it basically saved the Cherokee culture. And here in the Administration Support Department, we're going to talk about two uh, ethnobiology, ethnobiology topics tonight. We're going to talk about our seed bank, and we're going to talk about cultural forestry. Uh, the seed bank is probably why most of you are here uh, every year. Uh, uh, you maybe see stories in the newspaper that the Cherokee Nation is offering free seeds. And that's about as far as a lot of people get into it. They, they call up or write and say, we want free seeds. And really, they don't know what's going on. But what we actually have is a set, and I'm going to teach you some genetics tonight. We're going to learn genetics whether you want to or not. And um, you're going to learn, by the time you leave here or not, you're going to learn the difference between uh, Heirloom, for heirloom crops, modern crops, and genetically modified organisms. And uh, as Ms. Mackey stated, about six, seven years ago, uh, members of the tribal council uh, came to me uh, and, and made some inquiries about the, uh, the Icelandic seed bank in Svalbard. Um, we knew, I say knew, of a couple of Cherokee varieties of crops the most, the most famous Cherokee crop is probably the Cherokee purple tomato, which, by the way, has nothing to do with the Cherokee Nation. It was named after a county uh, back east and is actually a genetically modified crop. But we won't go into that. So uh, in doing some research, uh, there were uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. They had a, a program going on where they were trying to uh, revitalize some of the ancient heirlooms, which they still grew some of those back east. Uh, and uh, we thought that it would be a good idea for, the, for us here in Oklahoma to gain some of that seed stock and, uh, and, and make our own uh, seed bank and, and grow our own so we could have these to share with our, with our neighbors. Uh, and the reasons that why we wanted to do that had nothing to do with uh, uh, science or anything like that. It was that... Uh, we thought that it was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, the Cherokee language, uh, if you study it, it's a category four language. And the language is, like everything else, is very closely tied to our environment. And a word in Cherokee, there's no such really thing as a word in Cherokee, because a Cherokee phrase basically is a description. It tells you a little bit about the object. Uh, so uh, language and cultural preservation was a big component of why we wanted to do this. Most of, maybe most isn't a good word, but a high, uh, a, significant, a significant number of Cherokee words and phrases that deal with the environment have disappeared, disappeared long ago. So we thought this would be a really great uh, way to, uh, to preserve and uh, revitalize the language. Um, 
We also noticed that, uh, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we have a high rate of certain diseases like diabetes and so forth. And, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, we've been trying to get Cherokees out and active. Uh, so we thought that uh, this, 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 might be a good, this might be a good pathway. Not everybody likes to jog, but uh, gardening, trust me, is an aerobic activity. And uh, so we thought that would be good. And of course, there was the genetics of it that uh, when we began looking for these seeds, we found out that they basically didn't exist anywhere. There were just a few handfuls in scattered places across the United States. And as I said, I'm not a public speaker, so I get to, it's my prerogative to bounce back and forth. Um, uh, so we, we knew we had some corn out there. We knew we had some beans out there and some other things, and we began looking for them. We found some corn back east. We found some beans back east. We found some corns out west. We found some tobacco in a museum in Minnesota. Uh, we found uh, some gourds at a farm in Missouri. It took us about a year to come up with a, a set of 21 Cherokee crops that, uh, that we could tie back to uh, pre-European contact. And uh, after getting those, getting the seeds was actually the easy part, and then we had to go about growing them. Uh, besides being Cherokee, I'm a fourth generation Oklahoman from originally from this county and some of the surrounding counties, so I know how, I, we all knew how to garden, so uh, I said, well, it's not hard, we just stick some seeds in the dirt and it'll grow, and uh, for the most part, that's exactly how all you have to know to garden. It is not, uh, it is not a highbrow endeavor. Uh, this is all it takes to garden. Uh, you're going to hear lots of things about uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and so forth, but trust me, God has already done the heavy lifting and gardening. He made the seed, the rest is up to us. And uh, you can fudge on most of those things, but you can't fudge on the last part because gardening in July and August will produce sweat. One of the, the very interesting things that I noticed when we first began doing this is that uh, there were a lot of, of folklore, signs, uh, rituals that were associated with gardening. And uh, we found that most of the, the Cherokee, pra not most, but some of the Cherokee practices had actually been somewhat hybridized with some of the pagan European rituals uh, that you see in like the uh, farmer's almanac and things like that. Uh, I am a biologist by trade, so uh, I, I did offend some folks by saying, you know, you give me four inch soil temps of 65 degrees, water and dirt, and we will make this happen. And, uh, and we did. Uh, as I said, it's mostly sweat uh, and uh, <coughs> some really some uh, what I call archaic methods. Uh, we don't use uh, fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides in, in the garden. It's all uh, uh, sweat equity like uh, the folks that came before us would use. And uh, anyone in this room, and I mean anyone, I don't care if you live in an apartment or not, can basically do a garden. You can garden out of a pot. So, but if you follow these directions here, that's 90%, the other 10% is sweat. But if you go through this, you will, uh, it's, 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 you know, not to be religious, but God has taken the, the hard thought, thought out of gardening. You stick this seed in this dirt and it's going to grow. And uh, tonight I actually brought some seeds for those who want to take some home. So, uh, but I'd like to go through and discuss with you the varieties of what we grow and why, because I think you'll find it very interesting. Uh, we grow corns, we grow beans, squash, when you hear those three, you should immediately think of three sisters, uh, the three sisters gardening method. And then we grow some other things like the gourds, tobaccos, and, and uh, some other ancillary things that were important. Corn uh, is, well, it's mother corn to the Cherokees. It's a, it's a very important plant. Uh, it's... Uh, in antiquity, there might have been a plant that was just as important as corn, but uh, it was more easily wild crafted, so it wasn't really altered the way corn was. But uh, uh, corn rapidly became 
the plant of choice, not only amongst the Cherokees, but amongst all North, well, most uh, lower 48 uh, tribe, most, most tribes that live in what's now the 48 states. And the main reason is, is that corn has a very good product to work ratio. I can do a little bit of work and get a lot of product at the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's very easy to grow, it's very forgiving, and uh, it was actually improved or derived from grass, and grass is of course very common, so it was, and I'll, I'll get into that later. But uh, uh, what you see here are the, probably the three most important varieties of Cherokee corn. This is what kept your ancestors alive for about a thousand years. Uh, this is all of the exact same corn. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and forth. Uh, it's uh, Latin name is AMAs. It's mother corn, which, which we discussed. Uh, the interesting thing about corn is, is that corn, very easy to, for, for us to manipulate. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it came from grass, and we were able to turn basically tall grasses that like you see in the field today into this. Uh, but it, corn does not tolerate one thing, and it does not like to be around other corn. So what you see here is the product of hundreds of years of Cherokees taking some grass, not, and not just Cherokees, the people that came before the Cherokees, taking these, current, these seeds from grass, planting them over and over again, and getting the three distinct varieties you have here. Cherokees were the first geneticists. We realized that corn hybridized really easily. And there's such a thing as hybrid vigor, not in corn. A, a good corn here and a good corn here often produces no corn in the middle. So the Cherokees in three distinct valleys back east grew yellow flower corn in one valley, multicolored corn, flower corn in the other valley, and white flower corn in the other. And uh, all of these were very important and they were never mixed. And uh, we, we talked about this, uh, an interesting side note about corn. We call it mother corn, and a lot of people have always wondered why that is, uh, because why would we call something mother that we created? Uh, modern day anthropology has pretty much turned that on its ear, and man didn't really domesticate corn. As I said, corn came from grass. So uh, proto-Indians, those that came way before the Cherokees were established as a people, would see these fields of large grasses that had edible seeds on them. And those large fields of, of grasses allowed folks to be able to encamp around them and stay in one place longer. And when you stay in one place longer, you have more leisure time. You have more time to be able to develop uh, your culture, your language, your arts, uh, relationships between yourself. So. Cultural anthropology has basically said, well, we really didn't, man really didn't have a laboratory and turn grass into corn. It was a symbiotic relationship of corn keeping man in one place and the two working together to, uh, to what we have today. I, let's see, I may have, let's see. Sorry about this. I'm missing a slide here, I apologize, but corn, uh, we have grass, we talked about corn coming from grass. The next thing in the, I shouldn't use the term evolution because it has negative connotations for some, but in, uh, uh, in, in how corn progressed from grass, the next step was you had what was called a flint corn. And uh, remember all corn is grass, so you can use the term corn and grass interchangeably, but flint corn is a type of grass slash corn that has an exceedingly hard seed, hence the term flint. Uh, it was, like I said, it's very ancient and it uh, uh, lent, its, lent itself well to grabbing those seeds, the corn kernels, and storing them over winter. And then you, you could grind those up. And uh, after flint corn, then you have what's called a dent corn, which is a little less hard, a little produces a little more, and then you go into flower corn. Uh, flower corn is are these that we have here. Whoops, excuse me. Flower corn, and then if you were to continue 
that progression, which the Cherokees don't because this is where we stop, because this is, this is where we stop being geneticists, was right here. But the next progression of corn would be sweet corn, which uh, is what we would eat maybe 50 years ago. And uh, sweet corn is just that. It was, it was genetically selected to have lots and lots of sugar in it, and you, you, know, you slather it in butter and salt and eat the corn on the cob, and it's awesome. Uh, and then, of course, the next corn in line, which we'll talk about at the very last, is genetically modified corn. The, uh, interestingly enough, we talked about these corns that we developed. These were not brought to the Oklahoma along the Trail of Tears. Uh, these stayed in, back east. Remember I told you they all had their homes back east, so they, they, they weren't removed from their valleys. So what we decided to bring was a ceremonial corn with us called Cherokee White Eagle. And uh, we all know the story of, uh, of, uh, of relocation. But uh, the white eagle, I said, it was a, it's a flint corn, excuse me, a dent corn, so it's much older than flower corn, but still fairly heavily genetically selected. And uh, the thought was, was that, uh, I said it was ceremonial. And the thought was, if you can get the white eagle to fly in the new lands, everything will be fine. And this is a kernel of Cherokee white eagle corn. And some people say they can see the silhouette of an eagle flying in it. So uh, uh, it, yes, you can eat it. Uh, it would be, uh, it's suitable for grinding in the flour. Uh, and people do eat it uh, today. But uh, it's re it was really our ceremonial corn. And it is a, I mean, that is what the kernels look like. Purple and uh, uh, somewhat significant in the sense that uh, it's a very ancient corn that's had its uh, mitochondrial DNA studied. And from that study, we can determine that, of course, it originated in South America, where all corns did. It migrated up through Central America, Mexico, up the Mississippi River, almost to the Canadian border, then went east to the Algonquin nations, and then down south, to almost the Cherokee Nation. We can't trace it all the way to the Cherokee Nation, but we can trace it almost. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of the stories of Cherokee uh, beginnings, that's the exact story of where the Cherokees came from. Started way down south, came up through uh, the uh, Central America, all the way to Canada, over into the Algonquin Nations, and then back south to where we were, to, to the ancestral homelands. Now we'll go to beans. Uh, we grow uh, four varieties of beans. Uh, it's unfortunate that we live in Oklahoma for our Cherokee beans because Cherokee beans has uh, e evolved to grow in the North Carolina climate. So they don't like to pollinate once it gets over 90 degrees. You can grow great vines, 10 foot, 10 foot high vines, but uh, uh, the yield in Oklahoma is uh, a little less than spectacular. Uh, the last two years, not this, well, two years previous to this last summer, we almost got zero production out of these just because we can't pollinate the, the, our bean varieties uh, once it gets much past 92 degrees. Squash is the other, uh, the last component of the three sisters. And uh, this here is what you see is a baby squash. Georgia Candy Roaster is the squash of choice that uh, the Cherokees grew. And uh, these are going to, when they get mature, they will average about 20 pounds, uh, can weigh up to 40. And uh, they have what all heirlooms have, all Cherokee heirlooms have in common. And that is that the beans, corn, and squash was not eaten during the growing season. You had no reason to eat the crops that you grew in the garden during the growing season. You had everything in the wild that was available to you at that time. Heirloom crops were designed for one thing and one thing only, to keep you alive during the, the harsh realities of winter. Uh, there was no such thing as polypropylene underwear. When it would get below zero, we, you just couldn't get out. So it was those dried items that allowed you to survive those periods of winter. And this squash, of course, squash doesn't dry, but our squash, if left cool and dark, like in a garage, will last six months after being picked. 
and be just as fresh the day uh, six months as the day they're picked. So that's the thing to remember about heirlooms. We also grow gourds. Uh, gourds are a, uh, let me go back, to, well, I'll, I'll get to gourds later. And we grow tobacco and some miscellaneous things. The tobacco, very similar to modern day, I will call it recreational tobacco because I don't know of another term for recreational, but uh, uh, tobacco that you buy in cigarettes today comes is the species uh, Nicotiana tobaccum. This is the species Nicotiana rustica, and it has a nicotine content about 10 times higher than uh, recreational tobacco, and uh, so obviously would, uh, you would not have done a great deal of recreational smoking with this plant. Uh, and then uh, the other, another very important uh, or popular plant that we grow is Trail of Tears beads. And uh, some of the, maybe the, uh, the more senior ladies might recognize these as corn bead necklaces. This is what corn bead necklaces are made out of. So now we're going to talk about genetics and why I'm doing this to begin with. Uh, the heirloom plants contain a genetic code. Remember I talked about flint, dent, flower, sweet, and now genetically modified. Um, the genetic codes within these ancient heirlooms does not occur in the genetic codes we have today. And I'm going to tell you why that's that's important. I'm not, going to, I'm not allowed to say good and bad because I'm not going to say anything bad about genetically modified organisms. That's not what this is about. Uh, but uh, today, many uh, nations across the world are putting an awful lot of effort into saving heirlooms. And uh, you're about to see why. Uh, we had four, you've seen four corns that are Cherokee. Uh, there's actually a few more than that, but you've seen four. Uh, they're all, uh, it's all a single species. And uh, if I put a corn plant here, and then I put one 100 yards away, I'm not going to get either corn. Uh, corn really hybridizes dramatically, and the results are almost never good. Uh, often the results can be catastrophic and yield to no crop whatsoever. So the recommended distance between growing one type of corn to another corn is one quarter of a mile, 1,320 feet. And of course, if you go back to the story of our corn, we had three different valleys, of course, miles apart. But uh, as you can see, the Cherokees knew that you could not grow your corns together. Beans uh, is a, uh, it's a horse of a different color, so to speak. It, uh, uh, just as important, it was, uh, you know, corn has almost no protein, beans have much, a lot of protein. But uh, once again, beans, you know, it, it's, you didn't grow beans to snap and, and boil in a pot with uh, bacon and new potatoes. You let them grow to maturity, then you take the seeds out and you save the seeds. Beans, genetically, beans aren't supposed to cross. The problem comes when you have very industrious pollinators that uh, do weird things to the, uh, the female reproductive part of a bean flower. And uh, you can get crosses, but it is rare. But uh, that being said, even today, we do not grow our, we don't grow the same types of beans and set the same facility. Squash and gourds, very close related. Uh, much, much worse than, uh, than corn, actually. Uh, because squash and beans, I mean squash and gourds will actually hybridize in, interspeciesly. So you can have a, grow a gourd here and a squash here and they will do weird things. So separation distance for these is the exact same. It's worse with, uh, with both of these though because the pollinators that tend to frequent these guys fly long distances. So uh, even if you do things right, you can have bad results. So now you're going to find out just exactly why all these countries and why the Cherokee Nation thinks that we need to uh, be very concerned about saving these things. As I said, the Cherokees were geneticists. And uh, 
you had these grasses that were, that they had very beneficial characteristics. So those grasses, they were, they were cared for, they were nurtured, and that grass was allowed to live. And so on, generation after generation. And then we actually started planting these grasses, cultivating them. And generation after generation, we were able to pick the grasses slash corns we liked and get them evolved into where they are today. Generations, hundreds, thousands of years for corn. Genetic modification is a completely different ball of wax than that. It is a, it is a high tech laboratory process in which exceedingly sharp, tiny knives, I'm being facetious here, but you actually go into the DNA, you extract genes that you don't want and input genes that you do want. And the really cool thing about genetic modification is, is if I want to have a particular trait, I don't even, on, let's say I want to have a, I want to make corn grow a little bigger. I don't even have to use a corn gene for that. I can go to another, another plant entirely and, and you know, slice that little DNA up and sew my little uh, uh, vigorous growing gene in there from another plant and, and, and do that. And the change is instant. It's right then. That plant's gonna grow up and it's gonna have that characteristic. Um, heirlooms are not modified, they are selected. So hundreds, thousands of years we have seen traits and plants that we like. We nurture those, we cultivate those, and we have grown those into what we want them to be today. Today, the four Cherokee corns that you saw are corn plants that grow up to 14 foot tall and have cobs two foot in length. Now, you don't see corn like that out in the fields today, and there's lots of reasons for that, and I'll go into those, but as you can see, that's come a long way from a grass this tall that had little tiny, almost pepper-like seeds to, uh, you know, corn, ears of corn that are this long. Uh, GMO crops, uh, oh, about, uh, Genetic selection really began in earnest in the 1900s to uh, figure out ways to even improve upon the heirlooms. By the Second World War, we had became uh, pretty good. You know, as, as much as 20 years ago, we began actually modifying the DNA of these plants. And today, 99% of the corn you have is genetically modified. Uh, the same for soybeans, tomatoes rapidly. Uh, going up there. And I am not here to badmouth GMOs. That's not my job. My job is to grow heirlooms and to protect the genetics therein. So I'm not going to talk about GMOs, but I'm going to talk about some of the traits that they do. Uh, GMO crops, I said, you hear a lot about it on the news. Countries across the world are banning GMO crops. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that GMO crops feed most of the world. It certainly feeds the United States. Um, conversely, uh, there is a UN study right here that shows that uh, the agricultural world has lost about 94% of the varieties that we grew prior to 10 years ago. So if you, uh, if you extrapolate that out, that means that we've lost 94% of the genetic variability in our food supply. Uh, so that's why in the last 10 years you've seen, you've seen all of these organizations really rushing to save what's left, including the Cherokee Nation. And uh, you say, well, I still don't understand if, what 94% means. Here's why it's important. Here's the pluses for GMOs. The United States and many countries have what's called a cheap food policy. We do, we have an economy that's based upon us not having to spend a large percentage of our money on food. Uh, the powers that be have determined they wanted us to be able to spend a lot of our money on uh, industrially produced goods to drive an, an overall economy. So in order to do that, you have to bring the price of food production down. The easiest ways to do that are to make your plants all 
all come ripe at the exact same day, the exact same hour. You want them to be the exact same size so the combine that goes over them can set his, uh, can set his, set his height and keep on going. You want the actual crop size to be, you know, the actual ear of corn to be the exact size. You want it to take the same amount, all of the plants to take the same amount of water. You want them to uh, all take, need the same amount of fertilizer. You want everything to be the same so you can take one type of seed, throw it over thousands of acres, do the exact same thing. And that's what's happened. And uh, it has done wonders. And that's the reason why you can go to Safeway and buy two cans of corn for a dollar. Uh, that comes with consequences. Uh, when you take that little strand of DNA, you stretch it out and you begin slicing those genes out of it to insert the genes you want. There's no knife that's sharp enough to leave the surrounding genes unharmed. And generally what you find in genetic modification is that you lose your drought resistance, you lose your pest resistance, you lose your vigor, and uh, uh, you lose a little bit of nutritional value, but dramatically increases yields, makes it far easier to do that on a large scale. So that's the reason we do that. <laughs> So is that good or bad? Well, if you're the one driving the combine, which means if you're the one trying to sell as much corn, soybeans as possible with the least amount of effort, that's what you want to do. However, if you want uh, a wider variety in your food supply, it's pretty bad. Over the years, you have, uh, you've heard of major famines in, uh, in, in countries such as Africa, uh, often those are the result of entire genetically modified crops failing. Uh, and uh, they fail for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, a certain pest, fungus, or something like that, some type of vector can really hit that particular plant hard. And when you have the exact genetics in everything, if one plant is susceptible to this bug, they're all susceptible. And so they all die. The other thing is, is that uh, when you have the variety in genetics that you have in the heirlooms. Sometimes you're blessed with uh, something that you've never seen before. For example, increased fruit size, increased uh, nutrition there in the seed, something that we had no idea could be there. And then you can use that to improve the plant later. Uh, and then another thing about the uh, genetic modification, which uh, is why, mo is why a lot of the countries are now banning these, is that uh, it does unknown things. Uh, you heard probably several years ago, some folks with peanut allergies had, uh, had passed away without eating any peanuts. Uh, that was traced to uh, some genetically modified corn that had been treated with some peanut genes. And uh, they said it, uh, unfortunately, you know, and peanut allergies can be quite severe, so. Uh, you have, you're dealing with an unknown factor that we don't know uh, what's going to happen in 20 years. Um, so, as I said, countries, the Cherokee Nation, we're saving the seeds. Uh, we have about 22 varieties of seeds. The Cherokee Nation distributes about anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 packages of seeds at no cost to our citizens every year. And... Uh, uh, it's been uh, it's it's been successful beyond my wildest imaginations. I had no idea that this many people were as crazy as me and wanted to grow these plants. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's been a blessing for me, and uh, I'm really glad that the Cherokee Nation finds it uh, a worthwhile thing. The one thing that is vital for you all as practitioners of this is that it's very tempting when you're doing this at home when you grow your corn, you have this really nice corn. Yes, you want to save those nice representations of your fruit, of your labors. But you also have this little bitty corn that really didn't do so dang good. And it's, uh, it's kind of a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Those genes are just as important to that heirloom variety as are the good genes. So yeah, I'll take 85, 90% of your good stuff but always mix in some of the stuff that's not so good because that may, the stuff that's not so good, that may be the, 
the strong genetics that uh, uh, for drought resistance, which modern plants don't have, for pest resistance, which modern plants don't have. All the corns you saw, let me go back there. As I said, I'm not a public speaker, I'm a biologist, so I can do this. I go back, we look at these corns. If you had modern day corn, uh, you would notice that about a half of the corn would have, half of the corn tips where the silk would, would be damaged from the corn worms. Heirloom corn, Cherokee corn, it's too, way too strong for that. Once it, once it ripens and the, the corn worm moths really like it, they're going to go in there. But it's going to become so hard, so fast that that corn worm, it only gets to eat like one kernel and he's got to go somewhere else. And then, of course, if you don't have a lot of corn worms in your corn, then you don't have to worry about the birds coming and trying to rip the, uh, the husk off your corn to get to the corn worms. So uh, this, the, the genetics of heirlooms represent some strengths that uh, modern-day GMOs have to... Now, modern-day GMOs, you can see corn today that's genetically modified for drought resistance. But as I said, you do drought resistance, ah, you're probably going to lose pest resistance. You're going to lose vigor. You're going to lose seed size. So there's always a, a price to pay for, your, uh, for genetics. And as I said, once a year, this time of year, when we're doing our seed bank, uh, I brought some seeds tonight. Anybody can have. Anybody that wants uh, more, I think I brought corn tonight. Anybody that wants something else can see me afterwards, and we'll provide that. And... Uh, We've been doing this for about six or seven years, and we found that anything that can happen will happen. And as you can see, uh, uh, it generally does. Uh, and what I would urge most of you to be aware of prior to starting your garden is that it gets very hot in July and August, and every plant in your garden except for the weeds will need your help in July and August. The weeds can live by themselves. So, But uh, that being said, that's all we're going to talk about on the genetic crops tonight. So if you have any questions, well, we'll save questions to the end, and we're going to go into the other part of Cherokee ethnobiology, and that's uh, cultural forestry. This is actually two, two different uh, presentations, so I had to skip some of the repeats. Now, with the exception of Ryan and Donnie, I would like to know if anybody in this room can identify that plant. Wait a minute, Jeffrey Nicholson is in the room. He's not allowed to answer either. But you're probably looking at the most important native plant to the Cherokees. Cherokees would have used this in just about every one of their botanical concoctions. And it's a sad state of affairs when no one knows. But uh, Miss Nicholson, I'm it is ginseng. And what did Cherokees use ginseng for? What do we use ginseng for today? When you pick up a Red Bull or any of the monster energy drinks, what do you see at the top of the can? Ginseng was used for the exact same thing. Ginseng was an energy booster, it increased your vitality. So if you needed to uh, make a concoction to make you feel better from the cold, you would do that. If you really needed it to be strong and that quick, you would add ginseng to it. So you're looking at the most important Cherokee plant. And uh, ginseng, by the way, is a very insequential looking plant. It's about that tall, is a huge specimen. So. You know, about 10, 12 inches tall is all it gets. But packs a wallop, and we're going to talk about ginseng later. Uh, unfortunately, this is what most, what most people relate to Cherokee forest. They look at uh, the trees and they say, well, trees were probably a, the most vital component to the Cherokee homelands and why we moved back east and really, really helped us a lot. But if you think about it, the Cherokees in the ancestral homelands were a people without chainsaws. They were without axes. Uh, trees, yes, they did produce fruit, but the actual mechanics of a tree were somewhat shut off to the tribe. Uh, so uh, uh, somewhat important, but certainly not 
the forest for the Cherokees. The forest for the Cherokees was uh, what I'm about to go into. So we are going to uh, have a test over the most important components of the Cherokee forest. Now this is one in Oklahoma we should all know. What is it? Eastern red cedar, which by the way in Oklahoma is illegal. It is a noxious weed. You're supposed to control it. Uh, when uh, we did a survey of elders to see what was our most important plant, boom. Number one, eastern red cedar, much to the chagrin of the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Dogwood, very good. I want you to remember these two plants because we're gonna come back to them. You've seen this one earlier. No, it was, it was, think back to the native, to the heirloom garden. Tobacco. Ginseng. By the way, ginseng to me looks like a baby hickory tree, but uh, that's just me. Okay. When you go to the, when you go to the health food store, what's next to the powdered ginseng? Even think alphabetically here, folks. Not quote. I'm sorry. No. Golden seal. So why would these two things be listed together? Remember, I said ginseng was a very insignificant-looking plant. That's because ginseng is a plant waiting to die. Anything will kill it, uh, and it has a. Oops, excuse me. This just, this probably, even though it's not a real plant, has probably already caught a fungal infection just from being ginseng. So, when grown in close proximity to golden seal, which is used to treat fungal infections, you have this symbiotic relationship between these two plants. Very important. Ryan and Donnie cannot answer this question again, but uh, I would assume they would agree this is the most Im important plant in Oklahoma. Maybe? Is it the hardest to find? Yeah. Yeah. Aside from Jensen. Yeah. If you go to the Snop Dance, you have to have this plant. This is, it's called red root, but there are a number of red roots. It's a prairie willow or Salix humilis. It's, it's, uh, it's related to the black willow and the coastal pine willow. Very difficult to find. As far as I know, it can be found in two locations in the Cherokee Nation. One is here on the complex, but I will not disclose its, place, its lo exact location. The other is a very uh, rural place in Adair County. Have you ever heard of it growing anyplace else, Ryan? Not anymore. Hmm. This is a trick question here because we're talking about uh, plants, and this technically isn't a plant, but everybody knows you've seen this every day, grows on the north side of trees, grows on rocks, lichen. And lichen is a symbiotic relationship between bacterial and bacteria and algae. Every male Cherokee should know what this plant is. Every male Cherokee, technically, I guess, is supposed to have this on their person right now. This is rattlesnake master, often called the warrior's plant, and uh, is what allowed. Uh, Cherokee uh, men, and I'm, I'm assuming women, to be able to walk through the woods and not have to worry about the uh, ills of, uh, and evils of rattlesnakes befalling upon them. So what you have is you have the seven sacred plants of the Cherokees. And uh, for those of you who were counting, which it appears that none of you were, there were eight. There were not seven. So let's go back and let's figure out why there's eight plants in our seven sacred plants. Well, we have to go back to this and that. Remember how I said that Cherokees were losing? We had lost a lot of our environmental knowledge, a lot of our environmental culture. There's two trains of thought in the seven sacred plants. One is that the first plant is eastern red cedar. The other is, is that the plant is uh, dogwood. 
very different plants, very different uses. Uh, so it's, it's a shame that, uh, that we have lost a part of our culture that, that we can't positively identify which one is which. Both of these, uh, you have uh, Eastern Red Cedar using a variety of cultural applications, ceremonial applications, and then you have dogwood. Uh, utilized some as a, uh, as a textile, but mostly heavily utilized by uh, uh, high-level medicinal practitioners. So when you talk about uh, the seven sacred plants, you know, that's ancient knowledge. Let's move to some knowledge that, uh, that we still utilize on a daily basis today. And uh, this is the best place to start. Uh, and this plant is, uh, many people call it rabbit tobacco, but as a biologist, I found that generally when people can't identify a plant, they call it rabbit tobacco. So, but this is uh, uh, sweet everlasting. It is, uh, probably the most commonly used medicinal plant we have today. Uh, Cherokee name is Colstuda, and uh, it's used at, to treat uh, symptoms of the common cold. Uh, that's the traditional Cherokee science portion of it. If you were to go to the Western science portion of it, and you were to chop this all up and analyze what it is, it's an astringent, which means it shrinks mucous membranes. When you have a cold, your mucous membranes swell and get all sorts of nasty on them. So you drink this plant, you breathe its steamed vapors and so forth, and it shrinks those. Kind of a modern, uh, a old day mentholatum, so to speak. It's plants used by a lot of people. We obviously have no basket makers in the uh, audience tonight. Uh, blood root uses a dye. Uh, that, to me, this plant, uh, once you see it in the wild, once you can, there's no way that you can misidentify it with anything else. Does that get a single blossom? blossom? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and to me, the, the flower looks just like a strawberry flower, a little white thing. Uh, it's, to me, it's the leaf that, that, that's very striking. These we know. May apples. Uh, this is part of the mandrake family, and uh, in uh, far more people in the world than we here in the United States use the mandrake family for very uh, potent cancer medicines. Uh, we don't do that here in the United States. Watercress, yes. Where, is, is watercress native to North America? Watercrest is not native to North America, but they don't know how or when it got here. Very interesting. It's uh, considered native of, of, of Europe, but uh, the annals of Lewis and Clark reported it. Very interesting. Jay, Oklahoma, what's this plant? First week, first Saturday in July, Jay, Oklahoma. Huckleberries. And I have to, have to destroy a myth here. What we have in northeastern Oklahoma is not a huckleberry. It is a wild blueberry. Huckleberry is a completely different plant, but we call them huckleberries. But uh, actually, uh, uh, what we call huckleberries is actually a, 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 is, if you're splitting hairs, it's actually a blueberry. You're going to see these on the backs of trucks. Wild onions. Folks, remember one thing with wild onions, and the smaller the better. Echinacea. Most people around here call these those little yellow tomatoes that you see in the middle of winter. Carolina nightshade. Another very potent plant only used by fairly high-level Cherokee medicinal practitioners. That's about four foot tall, by the way. Nope. 
That is Green Dragon, which uh, uh, until very recently was considered a subspecies of Jack in the Pulpit. This is a good one to, uh, to trick people on. Come on, everybody, no, everybody wants to say what this is because everybody knows, thinks they knows what it is. But now that I've, how many people think this is thistle? It, it is not thistle. This is American basket flower. That's thistle, American basket flower. Boy, they look an awful lot alike, don't they? Well, you know what the Cherokees use this for? Prior to the introduction of Chinese thistle, or of Asian thistle, this was used to fletch blowgun darts. Now, introduced thistle is a much bigger flower, many more flowers on the same plant, and much easier to come by nowadays. So today, this is what you fletch blowgun darts with. That almost never, this almost all the time. Cherokees are a very resourceful bunch. Okay. I'm sorry? Blackberries. Not blackberries. Jewelweed. Who said that? Excellent, excellent. Jewelweed. And what do we use jewelweed for? Poison ivy. Yes, it's a poison ivy cure. <coughs> jewelweed is uh, near, near water. It doesn't like a lot of sun. Uh, it has to have some sun, but not a lot. So if you have a spring with very rich, loamy soils around it, that doesn't, so it's not wet, but you still have the spring going through it, you'll have jewelweed. And what do we call, what do most people call jewelweed now? It's got the most spectacular flower in the world. Touch me not. You touch that flower and its seeds explode for 10, 20, maybe even 30 feet. This is a plant that can take an eye out. Sassafras. Sassafras is one of those ubiquitous plants. It was, it was used by the Europeans as a tonic, used by the Cherokees as a tonic. Uh, probably has some good, uh, let me rephrase that, probably was used for some cold medicinal issues at one time. Uh, today in our overly litigious world, uh, most people really urge not to be drinking sassafras tea and so forth because of the arsenic content. You generally have to be pretty old to remember this plant, even though that this picture was taken just a few years ago. Chinkapins. Chinkapin. See, uh, oh, is this a trick question? A, uh, the, uh, the Oklahoma, the general way it's spelled in Oklahoma, which is accepted, and in the forest trees of Oklahoma spelling this, C-H-I-N-K-A-P-I-N, chinkapin. Uh, now, if you go further back east and want to become a little more sophisticated, is it C-H-I-N-Q-U-A-P-I-N? Uh, have you ever heard of a chestnut? Chinkapin is in the chestnut family. We all know what happened to the chestnuts circa 1900. Pilots from Asia, holding goods, uh, were infested with uh, a type of fungus that struck uh, all of our chestnut trees, which by the way was the main uh, component of the eastern deciduous hardwood forest, uh, and killed them all. This is a very close relative of the American chestnut uh, and uh, also succumbed to the exact same uh, fungal blight. And uh, today, you can still find this on the ri on ridges within Cherokee, Delaware, and uh, sometimes in Adair County. Uh, very common in Delaware County. The stumps for these things would have been this big around, which you normally can't see. But the, the fungus only destroys the above ground part of the tree. So that part of the tree dies, falls over, and then the roots sprout up. Uh, this tree here uh, was was near Watts. Uh, was probably the largest Adair, I mean the, the largest chinkapin tree in Adair County. As you can see, produced fruit. Uh, 
but uh, unfortunately a uh, water line project uh, was more important than this tree and had to be plowed right through it. So this tree doesn't exist, which is a shame. Uh, chinkapin tree to the Cherokees was called the bread tree. And uh, the chinkapin nuts, the chestnuts, were harvested, dried, ground into powder, baked into bread. The stories that you'll hear some old Cherokees relate to is, is that uh, they would become ripe very fast, and it was a race between the Cherokee gentleman with the 22 rifle and the squirrels who could get the most nuts. Everybody's seen this. You see this everywhere. Common mullein, uh, also called rabbit tobacco. It's uh, a very common arthritis medicine amongst Cherokee medicinal practitioners. Uh, many uh, Cherokees will consider this one of their most important plants. And just to show you how resourceful the Cherokees are, once again, this plant is from Asia, not native to the United States. Author generally arthritis, <coughs> arthritic conditions, rheumatism, Twenty bucks in October, right here. This is the only thing that I know that when you cook it up, it actually does taste like chicken. This is another trick question. Sorry, folks, in Oklahoma, we generally don't get this one right. Hint: that is a hickory tree that it's growing. That's a dead hickory tree. So, what would this be? Hickory chicken. Yes, but no. Yes, this is what we call hickory chicken in northeastern Oklahoma, but it's not hickory chicken. This is oyster shell mushroom. Uh, I can see why it's called oyster shell. Uh, but we do call this hickory chicken. Uh, this is hickory chicken. Very rare in Oklahoma. Very common in Oklahoma. Both edible. This one, pretty good, particularly when it grows on uh, sugar maple trees. Uh, but uh, has a wee bit of a, of a mushroomy, fishy flavor, in my opinion. Hickory chicken is far more akin to wishy, which wishy is, uh, as I said, it tastes like chicken. You know what the, uh, uh, the European name for wishy is? Hen of the woods. Staghorn mushroom. Once again, by the way, edible, 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 edible. Pretty strong mushroom taste in my opinion. As you can tell, I don't much care for mushrooms. Morels. By the way, morels don't really like the changes in our climate of recent times. Have you noticed that? Morels are getting harder to find. Uh, and uh, uh, I have a place in uh, northern Cherokee County where you can pick these things by the five-gallon bucket, and I, of course, hate them. I've never been able to find one of those on my place, but uh, people do like to come and get those. I'm sorry? No, because uh, I trade. I have trade. This is... <laughs> Oh, but, but by the way, I know several places on tribal land that with the CDIB, excuse me, with your Cherokee Nation card, I will give you a pinpoint location of where you can grab these by the bucket full too. And uh, what are you, about a month away from those, I guess? Maybe a month and a half? Somewhere out already. When you're thinking of these, folks, think of one thing. Think of river bottoms with sycamore trees. It's that simple. This is, I think, is probably this, actually the second most common eaten ch uh, Cherokee fungus, fungus, fungi. I don't know which, what's proper. Owl's head. One of those things, when you're frying it up, can soak up a gallon and a half of grease. Okay, so if you go and look at all of these things that are very important to us, 
200 years ago, very important today. There wasn't almost, a, you know, there really wasn't a tree in there with the exception of the chinka pen. And uh, as I said, you know, we didn't have chainsaws, we didn't have axes, so we lived with the plants that grew around the trees for the most part. And as I, as I said earlier, that eastern deciduous forest ecosystem that surrounded the ancestral homelands grabs the eastern part of the Cherokee Nation. So we were able to maintain mo and retain most of the same cultural and uh, uh, cultural activities, customs, and some of those same religious ceremonies because of that similarity. That's very lucky. Uh, if you look at other removed tribes, uh, a lot of removed tribes, they no longer have their language. They no longer have a lot of their... Uh, their customs and so forth. And that's because that all North American peoples prior to European contact would have been inexorably tied to their ecosystem. If you're in New York and you get removed to Anadarko, folks, there's nothing the same, nothing. But luckily from Cherokee, North Carolina to the Ozark foothills of Delaware, in Adair County, a lot of stuff is identical or at least very similar. And it saved the Cherokee Nation as a, as a it saved the Cherokee Nation cultural identity. And today we're having to, you saw with the seed bank, we're trying to continue to save that. Today we're, we're doing the exact same thing with some of these plants. Uh, 2008, nine, we did a ginseng project Ginseng doesn't grow in, the, in Oklahoma, but we had all of these stories of our elders, uh, people, my grandparents and their parents' age, collecting ginseng. I never could figure that out. Uh, what we think happened was that this plant, as I said, was so important that it was actually brought on the Trail of Tears in this form right here. Uh, the Cherokee word for ginseng translates roughly into mountain climber. If you can see where we're planting this, this is almost on a 45 degree angle, north face, north aspect of a, obviously, a, you can see the ferns there, a mountain climber. Some people claim they can see a torso ahead, two arms and two legs on this particular route. And uh, in 2009, we planted uh, these, which by the way, you're looking at 80 bucks right there which also can tell you why we don't have this anymore. And, uh, sorry, I took out a slide for this, but uh, we did this in 2008, 2009. We did uh, uh, about four or five test plots. We still have ginseng growing. And as you can, if you remember over the last several years, we've had drought weather, we've had uh, record cold, record, uh, uh, record uh, precipitation. We've had every weather extreme, and uh, the ginseng is surviving. It is definitely not thriving. Uh, we've had to fence it off because the minute it comes up, the deer want it. Uh, everything that could have happened to it, it's happened. It is. Uh, it blooms every year, uh, goes to seed every year, but the seeds never have a chance to mature because. Uh, the, the fence that we're using uh, doesn't have, uh, uh, it has openings in it that rabbits and squirrels can get through and uh, everything wants to eat this plant. The other problem it has is, as I said, oh yeah, there it is, we do have, is it has to be planted with golden seal. Uh, in Oklahoma, ginseng does a weird thing. Remember, ginseng is a plant waiting to die. It's trying to catch a fungal infection at every turn. But back east, where ginseng grows vigorously, golden seal comes up in uh, late April. Ginseng comes up in early May. For some reason in Oklahoma, ginseng comes up in early April and golden seal not until uh, late April. And uh, we generally have a pretty major fungal infection on all of our ginseng before the uh, golden seal has a chance to come up. Another uh, plant uh, very important to the Cherokee Nation is river cane. Today, river cane occupies less than one half of 1% of what it occupied prior to European contact. 
people have seen the Illinois River, the Barren Fork River. If you can find people that uh, maybe a little uh, that were around uh, in the early uh, uh, 1900s, those people are hard to find. It's a striking story. There was no gravel in the Illinois River. There was no gravel in the Barren Fork. It was a solid rock bottom they talk about. And uh, one thing that uh, we think that may have happened, it's the removal of all these cane breaks that surrounded these creeks that uh, resulted in the erosion. But anyway, uh, uh, river cane was, uh, it's actually w the only plant, I believe, that's on the Cherokee Nation's list of culturally protected species. It's against the law to, uh, to, uh, to harm river cane on tribal lands. And uh, we wanted to do a project and uh, we were able to find a private landowner that was willing to donate to us some uh, river cane rootstock. And uh, we, we did so. That's today, or that was actually last year. You can see this out behind uh, uh, Human Resources. It is a vigorous, nicely growing root cane break. And uh, a lot of people have, you, you hear some activities of people wanting to do river cane restoration, river cane reintroduction. Just can't be done on a large scale because to plant river cane today, you have to dig up this root stock in about 80 pound clumps. It is back-breaking work. And this is what it looks like in two years. It almost doesn't look any different. The person in the background is Mark Dunham. He, uh, he's the person uh, that's responsible for most of what you've seen tonight. He is actually having to go in with scissors in his hand and remove the Bermuda grass, the fescue competition from the river cane because river cane just cannot compete when it's trying to establish with these non-native introduced species. Today, this tide has turned. Our river cane is mature and it is encroaching upon that. Every year it takes about two foot away of the uh, Bermuda grass fescue field. However, it cannot compete with the lawn mowing crew of the Cherokee Nation. So, why can't we just plant these seeds that you see on this particular plant and grow river cane? Because what you are looking at here is a river cane plant that's flowering and making seeds. Because it only does this about once every 100 years. And do you see that right there? That is one, that is one individual plant. When you look, when you're going down Highway 10 and you see those huge deals of river cane, that represents one set of genetics. That is one individual. So uh, the interesting thing is that uh, we believe that Oklahoma has the most significant genetic diversity left in this plant. So uh, University of Mississippi and Auburn University have. Uh, are working with uh, Oklahoma trying to develop cloning technologies to develop seedlings to stick in the ground so we can maybe make easier ways to reintroduce this plant. But as of right now, it's back-breaking work. Um, as uh, Ms. Mackey said, I've worked for the tribe for 20 years. I've been blessed to be outside most of that. And uh, we have elders that have to have access to these plants every day and sometimes uh, they don't have the health that they did to be able to wander the woods to find them or maybe even to go collect them. So uh, what we do is we have an extensive GIS database of where all of these plants are on tribal lands and we can provide those to our senior citizens. And I spent 30 minutes bad mouthing trees but we do do a wee bit of tree planting this is the shagbark hickory tree, Kanechi. It's a mature one. This is a year two seedling. Once again, it grows exceedingly slowly. And then uh, here is an Osage orange planting. Osage orange, uh, I grew up in Wagner County, so you all probably refer to it as Bodark or horse apple, or hedge apple, or from Adair County, cow brain tree. 
And uh, today we still get lots of requests for buckets of these because for some reason a lot of Cherokee, our senior Cherokee ladies want these to put in the crawl space of their house over winter because of their uh, insecticidal qualities. I'm not here to say it works or doesn't work, I'm just here to say what they do. And the other important thing is, is that I can't believe we cut his head off, but that's Noel Grace in the background, Cherokee Heritage Center, one of our best bow makers. And of course, the bow dark is the tree of choice for carving into uh, bows. And uh, how those guys do it, I don't know, because if you ever tried to carve bow dark, it's like carving glass. I don't see how they do it. Very hard wood. And uh, once again, as with gardening, all of this work is, is tedious. It's, uh, it's subject to uh, everything that Mother Nature can throw at you. Uh, a lot of money for a little bit of product at the end. But uh, uh, as I said, I've been blessed over the years that uh, you know, I've been able to continue this work. And uh, for the most part, we get, a, we get a very good response from our citizens. We do have a book out that uh, if a Cherokee citizen wants a copy, they can uh, get with me. Uh, the book is actually, uh, it, was, uh, it was written by uh, uh, some groups, uh, some folks that I uh, work with and around, uh, but it's, it's actually controlled by the elders group, and we're not just allowed to give that out. Uh, when the book was first published, Barnes & Noble wanted it. Uh, it's a long story. But I can probably get uh, Cherokee citizens a copy of the book. And uh, the good news is, is that uh, we're working on a new book that will have 110 species, all of what you've seen here and many more. And if uh, we could get the author off of his lazy keister, we could get that out quicker. But uh, 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 that book will be available to everyone. And the proceeds from that book will, will get to go back into this program to make it even larger. What's the title of the new book? I think it's going to be that. Mm -hmm. And of course, with all of our books, we don't produce, we produced, you know, you can't get a book. This book you're looking here is called the English version. If you get the English version, you also have to get the Cherokee version because we were, it's cultural, it's cultural language preservation. So the Cherokee booklet has zero English in it. It's all syllabary because we don't, use sissy phonetics or anything. We use syllabary. So you get two books. And the new book will also be published the same way. It will come in an English version. The English version does have, as you can see, some Cherokee translation in it, but the Cherokee version is entirely syllabary. No other tribe in the world has that. And uh, ethno, ethno botanical topics, you've all seen the news. It's, it's, it's a big thing and is going to continue to uh, to grow in the future. And uh, with that, I will open up to questions and I appreciate you all coming. Ms. Mackey, the floor is yours. Widow Pat, that was very, very interesting. I hope you all enjoyed that, and I hope our folks watching online enjoyed that as well. Uh, there was a couple of reasons why I chose that topic. At this time, of course, it's time to start planting. It's time to start thinking about gardening, and I really want our folks to really start thinking about doing that again. I think uh, my parents' generation, they were, they still gardened and, and still looked in the woods for foods and things like that, but my generation, we're not doing that so much, and I really think we need to get back to that somewhat. Um, and you all, as our community groups, um, I think it's important to think about that in some of our community work because food is something you have to think about every day. You know, you may have a home, you may have a clothing, you may have some of those basic things, but food is an everyday uh, something you have to have. And so, um, and so I want people to start thinking about food in terms of growing and gathering and hunting and fishing again. And so, so that's an, one reason why um, I wanted to introduce this topic at this time. Um, my husband Ryan Mackey is here as well, and he's going to talk to you about some of our ancient um, 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 
growing cycles and and uh, fill you in on some of those festivals and how these things, these festivals brought our people together um, in terms of, you know, when we were planting and harvesting. And so Ryan Mackey, everyone, what else? It's good to be here. Don't want to take too much of your time. I'm also going to back this up to slide one. So if you want a copy of Pat's slideshow, you will have access via website. It's quite a lot of information to jump through. But this time of year, um, people are already starting to see the cardinals, not cardinals, but robins come around. And they say that um, it's a good time to start planting your roots, like your, your potatoes, other root-bearing vegetables. Um, as Pat pointed out, we don't always have to follow those ancient traditions as long as we know the science of the system. If the soil's warm enough and you have enough light and it's the right environment, it'll grow. But they say that, um, you know, when the, the Pleiades comes about, that's what they used to set the old planting time to. Um, that, that was a good time for corn, but you didn't want to really start planting your beans until the leaves on those hickory trees were about as big as a squirrel's ear. And that sounds like humor, but, but that's really what I, to I was told. A long time ago, we used to, to organize our, our yearly calendar by the moons. So the new moon was the time of year when the, when the month was renewed. Originally, the new moon for us wasn't the dark of the moon, but when that sliver appeared in the west right after the sunset. And of course, you know, the month would go out and there, there are approximately 29 and a half days between one new moon to the next. So some years would have 12 months and other years would have 13. We would have to do our new year in the fall. We had a ceremonial new year in the fall and that was when we had our big council meetings. Um, that was also right after the big harvest when we put away all the food for the winter so we could survive over the winter. After the fall new moon, we had a bit of a ceremony so we could get together and, and eat and feast. It was kind of like our modern Thanksgiving, but in reality, we really had Thanksgiving feasts every month. The fall harvest, though, was, was extremely special because that was when we pulled in the majority of our crops from the field and we celebrated. We celebrated everything that had gone on the year before. We had had our council meetings during the fall new moon time for the ceremonial new year. And we would have a big friendship festival in the fall and we would get ready for winter time. We had a special festival during the winter that reminded us that it was, it was time to start preparing the, the fields for, for the planting. But it also reminded us that, that things weren't so bad, even though it was cold and difficult. It was right around the time when we would have that new moon after the winter solstice. So the days begin to, get, begin to get longer, even though they didn't always seem like they were warmer. A lot of that ceremony had to do with the green things, especially evergreen things. Cedar that Pat pointed out was a big part of that old ceremony. The next big time of year would be around this time. A little bit later than now, but but when it was time to plant, uh, we, would have, we would have a big festival. And it was in the first, first new moon after the spring equinox. We would have another council meeting. Fall was the ceremonial new year, but the practical, the, the growing new year was really in the springtime. And if we had to throw in our extra calendar, they threw it in in the spring so the growing cycle would be accurate. Very similar to what some of the Algonquin tribes up to our, our northeast did, except uh, they used the groundhog as an excuse to throw in an extra month. We would plant our corn so that all the communities in that area would have their corn ripen at the same time. They would have a, a big festival once the corn was planted and they would have a, a big celebration so that they could mark their calendars in the future. And in the late spring, early summer, they had something called um, when the corn was first fresh and fit to eat. 
Um, today we call that green corn. And uh, in Cherokee, the word green, E.J. used me, is related to the word for new. E.J. or A.J. is something new. So green corn is equivalent to new corn. And although that old dent or flower corn wasn't as sweet as our modern corn that we eat on, on the cobs, they also called it roasting years time because even though it wasn't quite as, as, as savory as our modern varieties, it, it was probably the, the most delicate and, and enjoyable to eat during that time. But they left most of the corn on the stalks to ripen till late summer, early fall, where they would have their gri ripe green corn time. And the ripe green corn was really the time when, when they pulled everybody together, people were coming back from warfare, and it was time to make peace. Peace within our communities, peace outside of our communities. All these times of year were tied directly to the cycles of the corn and the crops. So all of our festivals, our dances, our, our big celebrations were tied to the farming calendar and the cycles of the natural world and the woods around us. Ripe corn was not just a time when the corn was ripe on, on the vines, when it was hard on the vines. It, originally, it was also a time when the nuts were ready from the trees. The hickory nuts, the acorns, or acorns as we say around here, and, um, and even, even those uh, chinkapans, chestnuts, all those different trees, they had, a, they had a mast, which would be a pile of, of nuts on the forest floor. They say that back when, when the deciduous woods were much thicker and there were old growth, they used to yield such an abundant crop that people would wade through a foot to two feet of, of acorns and nuts when they would walk through the forest. And we would use those things uh, for bread. It, it was part of our produce. And during the fall, that before we, we focused so much on the corn, our ancestors, even before corn was a significant part of our life, they used to celebrate the ripening of those nuts. So this cycle was tied to our, our everyday life. Everything we did was, was tied to the crops that grew in the field or the plants that we harvested in the wild. Food was considered uh, medicine to us. It was, it was a way of life. What you eat at, at certain times of year, they help keep your body healthy. Uh, people paid respect to those things that they took, just like they respected the things they grew in their gardens. So the presentation that, that Pat gave to us today is, is a good reflection of the knowledge that our people needed to survive just in the everyday world of the Cherokees. It's deeply tied to our ancestral cultural knowledge, and I would argue that it, it is the roots of our modern day spirituality. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I would like to um, point out that this is where the, the document of the PowerPoint that Pat went through is, is available to you to download. Um, we also want to make sure that if you have any questions for Pat, that, that you have the opportunity to ask him. Think about it. You can also come up and talk to him after the case. Kevin has some evaluation forms for our in-house folks that we really need you guys to fill out and let us know what you thought about tonight's presentation. With El Ryan. Um, that was the second piece, the second reason I wanted to have these two topics tonight. Um, you know, they're both um, they're both great um, presenters. One with PowerPoints and uh, uh, the academic perspective, but utilizing our cultural thinking as well. Um, I really appreciate seeing that. Uh, Ryan, um, just giving you in, information from uh, um, his experience as well, and we call that oral tradition, just passing down information from family to family and through the generations. And so those are uh, two different styles of, uh, of, of learning uh, and teaching. So. 
on Ryan's presentation, there was a focus on festivals and celebration. You know, Thanksgiving, that was our holiday. That was that was a native thing. That was a native event. And people don't generally think about it that way, but that was just, I think, the tribe at that time that uh, uh, that uh, ate with the pilgrims, I think that was probably just one of many celebrations they had every year. Um, they were very thankful always for uh, surviving together year after year and took everything um, serious from planting to harvesting and the storing of food and and uh, strengthening, strengthening their bonds because it took a whole community uh, to survive. Everybody had a role to play. Everybody had responsibilities. And so anyway, think about that too when you go and do your community work and you do your planning. Think about festivals and events and and maybe bring in back some of those things as well and see how that might fit into your to your yearly plans as well. And so but I I think we're gonna wrap it up if there aren't any questions. Next time I think we're gonna work on maybe uh, having the ability for people to submit questions online. This was our first presentation presentation. So next month, we're going to have Jean Norris talking about how to conduct genealogy research. We're real excited about that. It's the number one topic I, uh, um, I'm i asked about when I travel. And so there's a lot of interest in genealogy. Um, again, just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank um, the Cherokee Nation community and cultural outreach staff and Pat Gwynn, again, for representing natural resources and now an administrative support and all his work he's done here over uh, 20 years now. And Ryan Mackey, our other speaker, who is active in language, culture, uh, anything culture, revitalization and uh, perpetuation. So uh, we look forward to visiting with everybody again next year. Wado. Or next month, sorry. Wado. Mm-hmm.